Good morning. Great to see you this morning. Great to have you that are joining us online. Welcome. If you haven't already, I uh, would invite you to grab a bulletin, whether it's here in person or if you're online, go ahead and access the digital bulletin at this time. There are a couple announcements I just want to quickly highlight, make sure that you're aware of. One, just uh, want to say thank you to those that have uh, contributed, have been a part of the giving tree this year. All of the items were taken, and we had some extra items that were donated on top of it. Um, somebody went ahead and, and bought meals for all of the shut-ins that, uh, that we can give a meal to, um, and we, we greatly appreciate that. There are some other items above and beyond what we had put on the tree. We weren't sure if we'd be able to, to have them all taken, but you guys rocked it out once again this year. Shouldn't ever doubt you, but uh, again, thank you for doing that. If you have not brought in your gift, if you could help us out and bring that by uh, today, that would be greatly appreciated. We're planning to make a bunch of the stops tomorrow and Tuesday, and so if you could help us out with that, if there are any other gifts that haven't been brought in, greatly appreciated. Again, um, we want to celebrate Christmas, and uh, we have some gifts for kids and teens after service, if you go to the cafe, you can uh, get a bag and pick a t-shirt. And you know what? We've got lots of adult-sized t-shirts from Clubhouse over the years as well. So if there are adults that would like a t-shirt, you guys stop by the cafe and grab one of those as well. You're welcome to, to do that. Final thing that I wanted to say is uh, really looking forward to Friday night as we celebrate Christmas Eve together, a special Christmas Eve service that we planned again this year, and we are, again, like last year, doing Christmas Eve at home, and there are a variety of reasons that we've chosen to do it again this way, uh, but trust that it will be a, a special time for you as a family to gather together. Also, maybe where there's flexibility, because we're providing it on DVD, so we went ahead and pre-recorded this week uh, the service so that those that can't access Facebook Live or the internet uh, kingswesleyan.com on Friday night. You can go ahead and get the DVD and play it at home and participate as though you are with the rest of us, okay? And so those DVDs are available, but the home packets are available in the cafe. Um, grab wh whichever one fits your family. And uh, I mentioned this before, but I just want to again say it. Please be uh, encouraged, understand, like you are more than welcome to invite others to join you whether it's other family members or friends, if you'd like them to participate in the Christmas Eve service at home, that's an invitation to, to do so. And uh, if you need to grab a packet during the week, you're not sure if they're going to be able to join you or whatever, let us know. We'll make sure that you get a packet. There will be, the church will be open on Friday uh, in the morning for those uh, last minute ones that want to come in and get a packet as well. But looking forward to it, I really believe it's going to be a meaningful service. But part of it will be up to you because there are some discussion helps at the end of the service. And uh, so it, it's really going to be as meaningful as you make it, okay? We've, we've tried to do our part to help set the stage for that. Uh, but in the end, a lot of it's going to be up to you what you put into it. It's about a 20-minute service. And so not a large chunk of your time, but definitely want to focus in on Christ. And as Tom said, the reason for the season. Well, we are in the book of John. If you haven't already, I'd encourage you to take your Bible or find a Bible and turn there. Whether it's a, a Bible that you brought in today or you've got a smartphone or a tablet and you've got the Bible app or access to, to, to the Bible on there, John chapter 1, or if you want to grab a KWC Bible and turn to page 750. Whatever works for you, love for you to be able to follow along this morning as we look in to God's Word and Talking about John, John who wrote the book of John, the gospel according to John, was one of the 12 disciples and one of Jesus' closest friends. And he's going to tell us more about another John, a John that he's mentioned in the previous weeks as we've been going through John chapter 1. But he's going to tell us more about this John, John the Baptist. And John the Baptist is going to tell us more about Jesus. And throughout this passage, we're going to see two keys to a life-giving 
Christmas. Two keys to a life-giving Christmas. John chapter 1, beginning with verse 19. Now this was John's testimony, John the Baptist's testimony. When the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. And so John the Baptist is ministering. He's doing, what do you think? Baptizing people. But he's not just baptizing people, he's preaching. And he's doing other things, likely he's performing miracles as well. And he's starting to cause a stir among the Jewish leaders, like, who is this guy? He dresses weird, he eats weird things. In our day and time, he'd have been somebody that you'd have like, dude, you need to go try out for Fear Factor or something. You're like, you could do one of those shows that, that you eat weird things and stuff like that because he just, he was a, a different kind of guy, but God was using him and people's lives were being changed and he got the religious leader's attention. And so they send a group to ask him who he is. Verse 20, he did not fail to confess, but confessed freely. I am not the Messiah, which makes me think that like their leading question is or was, are you the Messiah? Because I don't think John just comes out with, well, I'm not the Messiah, Unless they said, are you the Messiah? And he confesses freely, that's not me. I'm not that guy. I wonder though, how many of you would have been, how many of you would have been tempted? To like, well, maybe. Well, how, how much does it pay? What will I get if I am? I could be. Well, they go on. So, okay, he's like, I'm not him. I'm not the Messiah. But they really want to know, who is he? So they asked him, then, who are you? Who are you? Are you Elijah? Now, why would they say, are you Elijah? Well, it goes back to Malachi, one of the prophets in the Old Testament. In Malachi chapter 3, the, the Lord proclaims through Malachi that there would be one that would come that would prepare the way. And then in Malachi chapter 4, it says, I will send Elijah to you in the day of the Lord, in the day of great trouble and distress. So there's this idea of Elijah. Well, who is Elijah? Well, Elijah was a prophet of God in the Old Testament that did amazing things for God. And because of God's power. But Elijah never died. Elijah was taken up in a chariot of fire. And they're like, is this Elijah like coming that came back? And John's like, no, nah, I'm not I'm not Elijah. The problem, though, that some people have is there seems to be there seems to be a disconnect, or there seems to be like these things don't go together. Because John says, "I'm not Elijah," but later on, or actually earlier in Matthew chapter eleven, Jesus would say, "What did you go out into the desert to see?" Well, who's in the desert? Who's in the wilderness? John the Baptist. A reed swayed by the wind? If not, what did you go out to see? A man dressed in fine clothes? No. Those who wear fine clothes are in king's palaces. Then what did you go out to see? A prophet. Yes. I tell you, and more than a prophet, this is the one about whom it is written, I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way before you. Malachi chapter 3. I tell you the truth, among those born of women... There has not risen anyone greater than John the Baptist. Pay attention to these words that Jesus is declaring about John the Baptist. Yet he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing, and forceful men lay hold of it. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, Jesus says, he, John the Baptist, is the Elijah 
who was to come. So it sounds like Jesus is calling John Elijah. And John says, I'm not Elijah. So what gives? There's not really the problem if we understand what Jesus is saying. He says, if you are willing to accept it, John is the Elijah who was to come. Is Jesus saying John is Elijah? No. Jesus is saying John is the Elijah who was to come. In other words, it'd be similar to like somebody saying, Steph Curry is this generation's Michael Jordan. Or Michael Jackson was that generation's Elvis Presley. John the Baptist came and did similar things, worked in the spirit of the same likeness that Elijah had. He was a prophet of God. He declared God's word. He told people about the way. That's what John the Baptist was doing. He was declaring God's word and he was telling people about the way. I wonder, have any of you ever had a case of mistaken identity? Anybody ever thought you were somebody that you weren't? I, I get this like, I don't know, it seems like all the time, like uh, I'm at Walmart and they think I'm a Walmart employee. <laughs> I'm looking at something and like, sir, can you tell me where to find like some, some, such and such? Like, I guess I just have one of those faces. Like, I mean, all kinds of things. I was at Halo Burger with my family over in Birch Run a few years ago. And a lady's like looking at me and looking and like finally comes and like, I'm sorry, but are you Josh Elliott? And I, I, I had a look at, I didn't know who Josh Elliott was, but he's a, a newscaster, a news host, and he's worked for like uh, CBS or NBC, I think a couple different ones. Like, part of me like, yes, I am. Would you like my signature? You know, like, <laughs> like, no, but it's not just adults, teens, when I was a youth pastor and took some teens to a conference, I had a teen, we were hanging out, and another teen was like, are you Keith Connor? And Keith Connor was the guy that was leading worship at the conference that, that year, and I'm like, are you Keith Connor? Like, if I started singing or tried to play the guitar, you would automatically know that I'm not Keith Connor, but I can drive the bus like Keith Connor, that was his like hype song that he used. To, to get going, but the, the best one that I had, like, was at the elementary school doing my little rounds at lunchtime a few years ago, and I don't know, you know, the whole rock, paper, scissors and everything, and, and one of the girls looks up at me and is like, you look like Justin Bieber. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bless you, my child. <laughs> So, you know, if you guys want to call me the Beebs, I, you know, it's, it's, it's understandable. You won't, you won't be the, the first. But John the Baptist has these guys come to him like, who are you? Who are you? Are you the Messiah? No, I'm not him. I, I'm, not, I'm not Elijah, and, and I'm not the prophet. I'm not the prophet. The first life-giving key that John the Baptist, I think, would tell us this Christmas is know there's great freedom in knowing who you aren't. Know that there's great freedom in knowing who you aren't. Some of you are having a hard time experiencing all that Christ has for you this Christmas season because you're too busy trying to be somebody or something that you're not. Unlike a young man that I sat, that sat in my office many, many years ago, back when I had an office in the back farthest corner of the church, which I, I think there was intention in that. Like, let's give the youth pastor the, the office farthest away from the senior pastor's office like away from everybody else. But I had a young man that, that came in and he sat in my office, sat on the couch, and he believed he was Jesus. Like, I think you've smoked lunch too many times, buddy. I don't think any of you have that problem, my guess is. 
but I think there's probably some of you that suffer with what they have called the Savior Syndrome. You carry the weight of the world on your shoulders. You believe, you act as if it's up to you to solve everybody else's problems. And I think John the Baptist would just want to whisper in your ear, like there's freedom in knowing who you aren't. You aren't everybody's savior. Truth be told, you probably have a hard time tying your own shoes some days. Or maybe that's just me. But there's, there's great freedom in knowing who you aren't. For some of you, you need to know you're not Santa Claus. What do I mean by that? Well, this Christmas season, we understand that Christmas is the season for giving, right? And that's wonderful. But you need to know who you aren't. Because sometimes when you give, 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 you end up as a slave, slave, slave. Because you're giving through Visa, you're giving through MasterCard, you're giving through American Express, you're giving, 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 but you're becoming slave, 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 because Scripture says that the borrower is slave to the lender. And I think John the Baptist would again whisper in our ears and say there's great freedom in knowing who you aren't. There's great freedom in knowing who you aren't. But again, there's this question. Who are you? Who is John the Baptist? Well, that's what they're at. Verse 22, finally they said, Who are you? You've told us who you aren't. Now tell us who you are. Give us an answer to take back to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And I just want to ask you a question. How do you identify yourself? What's your identity? Is your identity in your profession? Is your identity in your sexuality? Is your identity in uh, your name, your heritage? Is your identity in your nationality? Is your identity just like, well, I'm somebody that you better recognize. Where do you get your identity? The core of who you are. When somebody asks, who are you? What should we say about you? What's What's the most important thing about you? Here's John's response. John replied, in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am. You want to know who I am? I'm the voice. Of one calling in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. He doesn't tell him his name. He says, I'm just a voice, I'm just a tool that has a purpose. He totally connects his identity to his God. Who I am doesn't really matter. What really matters is this message make straight the way for the Lord. This is John's theme. John the Baptist, it's not about me, it's about him. It's not about me, it's about him. We keep seeing this with John the Baptist. We'll see it today, we'll see it in a few weeks as we continue on through the, through the book of John and learn a little bit more about John the Baptist. Now the Pharisees who had been sent questioned him, why then do you baptize if you are not the Messiah, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? Why are you doing what you're doing? So John's going to give them a quick little answer and doesn't really even completely answer the question of why. Again, it's not about John, it's about Jesus. He says, I baptize with water, but among you stands one you do not know. He is the one who comes after me, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. Again, John's like, I know who I'm not, and there's great freedom in knowing who I'm not, and There's humility here in John the Baptist. John the Baptist says, I'm not even worthy to untie his shoes, his sandals. 
Now, that's a little lost on us in our culture. In John's culture, there were students that would follow a rabbi, a teacher, and Jesus was a rabbi, a teacher. The 12 disciples often would call him rabbi. And they would, the, the disciples would follow a rabbi and they would do different things for a rabbi. But one thing they would not do for a rabbi was, was untie their shoe and wash their feet. That was, a, that was reserved for, for servants. And not just any servant. That was like for the lowest of the low. I mean, that was the job that nobody else wanted to do. It was like the servants get together and it's like, one, two, three, not it. Like, who's going to have to wash the feet? Who's going to have to untie the shoes? Because untying the shoes meant you were going to be the one then that would wash the feet. Like, I don't want to do that. I mean, just think about it. Even today, and we're pretty pampered, and most of the time wearing socks and shoes, and so our feet aren't nearly like what the ones would have been in John the Baptist days. Right? Open-toed shoes, but they didn't have paved, paved roads. They didn't ride around in cars. They walked where they went. And oftentimes it was gravel at best, muddy, horses walked on it, other animals walked on these roads. What do horses and other animals do when they go for walks? So somebody like, I know exactly what they do. And what happens inevitably when you're walking, around the, walking along the road like, oh man, how many of you have done that before? Like, Oh, stepped out in the yard or whatever. And like, and like, mm, like, and John the Baptist is saying, the lowest servant in the household would have this task. I, I'm not even worthy to do that. He is so far above me. Now let's keep in mind, who is saying this? John the Baptist. Not just, not just any John. He is John the Baptist. You, you've got to be something if you have a tagline on your name. Right? I mean, you just don't, just don't become John the Baptist unless you've got some kind of recognition, some kind of following. Even Jesus himself would say that John was the, the greatest. No one greater had been born of women. But yet, John the Baptist realizes he's, he's nothing. He's a no one compared to Jesus. There's great freedom in knowing who you aren't. So really, the, the question then is, well, who is Jesus? It's not so much, who is John? The real question then becomes, who is Jesus? The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, or some translations use the word behold, which I like a little bit better because it gives a little bit more oomph to it. I mean, look can be okay and it can get somebody's attention, but it's oftentimes followed by something like, look, there's a squirrel. Like, okay, not really something that I necessarily need to divert my attention to and really spend a lot of time on. But when John says the word look, it's not just like, hey, give a quick glance, check that out. It's a soak this in, pay attention to, behold, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said a man comes after me who has surpassed me because he was before me, which we looked at a couple weeks ago, and John the Baptist was declaring as John the evangelist or John the beloved, John the writer of the gospel according to John, would help us to see that Jesus is God. John the Baptist is, he, is pointing to the eternality of Jesus, that he's always existed. We celebrate his birth as man on Christmas, but we're reminded that as the Son of God, He's always existed. And John said, 
He's come, he comes after me, but he surpassed me because he was before me. Well, what does this Lamb of God all mean? Well, we're going to see the lighting of the Advent candle for today, the love candle, and our passage of Scripture, they come together. There's a convergence here. Because in his love, we talked about sacrifice. And here, John is calling Jesus the Lamb of God. For those especially that were Jewish, a lamb and God together would have had great significance. For many, likely, they would have thought of the Passover lamb and a celebration that had taken place every year, a tradition that had been carried on since the first Passover when Moses was preparing to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. And all of the Jews sacrificed a lamb and put the the blood of the lamb above the doorpost. So when the death angel swept through the land, he would come to the household and there was blood on the doorposts. He would pass over that house and the death to the firstborn would not come to that household. And so they celebrated God's mercy, God's grace every year with the Passover feast in celebration. But there would be a lamb that would be a sacrifice as a reminder of God's grace upon their lives. The Jews also would have no doubt thought of Exodus chapter 29 where a lamb would be slaughtered every day for the forgiveness of of sins, a sacrifice for the sins of the people. And so we see that Jesus is a sacrifice for the sins of the world. So number two, John would tell us that a life-giving Christmas, the key, the second key, is see that there's great forgiveness in seeing who Jesus is. See that there's great forgiveness in seeing who Jesus is. And we use this word see, we use it like John was using it. It's about experience. We celebrate Christmas because Jesus, the Son of God, came to sinners and died as the Lamb of God for our sin. He came to our place and then took our place. You know, Jesus came into the world because the whole world needed Jesus. It's interesting at Christmas time to open gifts and to see what different people gave you. And you've probably had those moments like you open it up and like, what is it? I don't know what this is. Or, great, I really needed that, right? Like throw it over in the junk drawer or put it in the pile to take to the Goodwill or something like that. Like I, I don't need that. Christmas, we're reminded that we needed a great gift. The greatest gift that we ever needed was forgiveness for our sins. That was John the Baptist's message. When he was preparing the way for the Son of God, the Lamb of God, was, (laughs) you need Jesus. You you need Jesus. You need Jesus. Y'all need Jesus. And, And people started picking up on the idea that they needed Jesus. They needed to repent. And, and you think of it, John's message and method wouldn't have likely been, like this isn't a strategy that most church growth uh, people would say, here's what you need to do. You need to dress weird and eat weird things. Go to a place where most people aren't really hanging out, like the, the wilderness, and preach a message that tells people that they're a bunch of sinners and that they need to repent. But that's exactly what John did because that's exactly what Jesus, what the Lord had told him to do. What God the Father had told John the Baptist to do and the Holy Spirit had dwelt in him from birth, Scripture says. And so John the Baptist just did what John the Baptist was supposed to do and his message was, you all need Jesus. And so there were people that came along like these religious leaders and they, well... I'm a pretty good guy. You're like, no, you're not. Repent, you need Jesus. 
And then there would be others that would come along that like, I'm, I'm a horrible person. And John the Baptist was like, you're right. Repent. You need Jesus. And there's great forgiveness when we see Jesus for who he is. The second key to a life-giving Christmas. To see that there's great forgiveness in seeing who Jesus is. The gift, of, the gift of Christ this Christmas is what he has taken away. You think of that. There's so much that Christ adds to our life. But also a big part of the gift of Christ is what Christ has taken from us. The Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. We continue... Verse 32, then John gave this testimony, I saw the Spirit come down from heaven as a dove and remain on him, and I myself did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize with water told me. The man on whom you see the Spirit come down and remain is the one who will baptize with the Holy Spirit. I have seen and I testify that this is God's chosen one. Just want to quickly point out that here in John chapter 1, as we work our way through the chapter, we have now seen all three members, all three persons of the Trinity. We talked a few weeks ago as we started the series about Jesus being God. And I talked about the Trinity, when God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And in the first several verses, handful of verses of John chapter 1, we see God the Father and we see God the Son. Now we see God the Spirit. And when at Christ's baptism, all three members of the Trinity are present. Jesus is being baptized, the Son of God. As he's being baptized, we hear a voice from heaven, God the Father, say, this is my Son with whom I am well pleased. And Scripture also tells us that the Spirit descended upon Jesus in the form of a dove. And John says, he's the one, he's the one the anointed one. It's all about Jesus. You know, I think if we could just kind of summarize all of this together in one big idea, I think John would tell us this Christmas season, be a nobody who lives for nobody but Jesus. Be a nobody who lives for nobody but Jesus. That was John's heart. In John chapter 3, verse 30, John the Baptist is recorded as saying, he, Jesus, must become greater and I must become less. I must decrease and he must increase. It's all about him. It's all about Jesus. For John the Baptist, it wasn't, it wasn't about John the Baptist, it was about Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Casting Crowns has a, a song out. Maybe you, you've heard it. I'll share some of the words. It's a song called Nobody. It says, Why you ever chose me has always been a mystery. All my life I've been told I belong at the end of the line. With all the other not quites, with all the other, with, with the, with all the other never get it rights. But it turns out they're the ones you were looking for all this time. Because I'm just a nobody trying to tell everybody all about somebody who saved my soul. Ever since you rescued me, you gave my heart a song to sing. I'm living for the world to see. Nobody but Jesus. I love it. The song goes on. Moses had stage fright. David brought a rock to a sword fight. You picked 12 outsiders nobody would have chosen. And you changed the world. Well, the moral of the story is everybody's got a purpose. I don't just pause right there. So I heard a preacher say one time, you know, we, we look at doing something great. He said, don't, don't worry about doing something great. You just do what God tells you to do because whatever you, tell, whatever you do for the Lord is great because Jesus is great. We've all got a purpose. Casting Crowns goes on to say, So, when I hear that devil start talking to me saying, who do you think you are? I say, I'm just a nobody 
trying to tell everybody all about somebody who saved my soul. Ever since you rescued me, you gave my heart a song to sing. I'm living for the world to see. Nobody but Jesus. So let me go down, down, down in history as another blood-bought, faithful member of a family. And if they all forget my name, well, that's fine with me. I'm living for the world to see nobody but Jesus. As Larry comes to lead us one more time, that would be my prayer for you this Christmas season. That you would be a nobody who lives for nobody but Jesus. That you would find the freedom in knowing who you aren't. And that you would find that great forgiveness and purpose and life in knowing who Jesus is. His name is worthy to be lifted up, amen? Amen. To be exalted, for us to live for and to point others to. Invite you to stand as if you're able as we finish up our service today, lifting up the name of Jesus. A newer song, I'm going to give you a little bit of help. The chorus, or the, the verses that goes to uh, Come Thou Fount. So if you think of Come Thou 